everyone. And thanks Brady Pack for hosting this event this evening. Thank you each and every one of you for joining us on this call this evening. And I would like to give a very special thanks to Brady Pack for organizing and hosting this event. Their support has meant so much to me and I'm always so encouraged and honored to participate in their work in gun violence prevention. The organizations that we'll have with us this evening are the Brady Campaign, Coalition to Stop Gun Violence, Community Justice Action Fund, Every Town for Gun Safety, Giffords, and March for Our Lives. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And my name is Lucy McBath, and I am the Congresswoman for Georgia's sixth congressional district. And I do wanna thank every single person on this call for joining us. We know there's so many other things that you could be doing, but as many of you know, I lost my son Jordan in a racially motivated shooting to a man who was unable to see my son's value in the world. Regardless of whatever titles I hold now or whatever titles I may, I may hold in the future uh, or my political career, the most important title I will ever hold is Jordan's mom. And when I had Jordan, I, I just loved being a mother. He was such a caring child, a caring child, and would always go to great lengths to make sure that uh, no one in his circle of friends ever, ever felt left out. While I was raising Jordan, I was working as a flight attendant for Delta Airlines. I flew for 30 years and I would schedule every single one of my trips to make sure that I was home every single night to mother my child. Then almost eight years ago, um, my life completely changed overnight. And my, my son was with his friends, Jordan was with his friends and they were in Jacksonville, Florida and they were going simply, just going simply shopping uh, from one mall to the next. And they stopped at a convenience store gas station. Within that three and a half minutes, they stopped to get chewing gum because my son said, if we're gonna get girls at the mall, we have to have fresh breath. Within that three and a half minutes, a man named Michael Dunn pulled in next to the boys on the passenger side. And he told them to turn their thug music down. They were playing loud music. He called them gangbangers and he called them thugs. And he proceeded to shoot 10 rounds into the car, three of those bullets killing my son instantly. Now that very deeply racially motivated hate uh, acted out by a gun that day, that, that completely changed my life because that man acted all of his racist uh, tropes and biases and discrimination simply because he was empowered by a gun. I went from being a regular suburban mom to a mother on a mission. I began demanding more from our leaders. Why were they silent about gun violence in America? And almost 100 Americans every single day and more continue to die by unnecessary gun violence. And our leaders, they were doing nothing, especially for communities of color, which continue to remain disproportionately impacted by gun violence every single day. So I began a career in advocacy for safer gun laws. I became the national spokesperson for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America and Every Town for Gun Safety. And then I decided to run for office in 2018. I am proud to say that we flipped our seat here in Georgia. I actually now hold the seat that was once held by Newt Gingrich. And I'm the first woman of color to ever hold this seat in the history of Georgia. Now we've made so much progress and so many strides, but we still have so much work that's left to do. There is truly so much at stake in this next election. This election is very crucial to the work that we do. It's no secret that we are in some very, very dark times right now in our country, in America. We must stand together to elect people who will make our government for the people because it is by the people. 
It's vital that we stand up, speak out, and vote now more than we ever have. This nation needs change in our leadership. Tonight, we'll have several panel discussions with some very phenomenal people that are doing phenomenal work across the nation. The very first panel discussion that we'll have this evening is breaking the cycle, preventing gun violence in impacted communities. And those participants in this panel discussion will be Community Justice Action Fund, or as we'll call it, CJAF and Brady. Now, it's no surprise to anyone watching that we have a gun violence problem in America, a crisis that is uniquely American. The United States gun homicide rate is 25 times higher than that of other high income countries. And this crisis is felt hardest by communities of color, 74% of all gun violence victims in the United States are Black Americans or Hispanic Americans. And I'm joined by Greg Jackson from the Community Justice Action Fund this evening, as well as Kelly Sampson from Brady to discuss how to break these cycles of violence and prevent gun violence in impacted communities. Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us. And Greg, I just want to go ahead and start uh, with a question for you. you now, gun violence is a crisis that's impacting hundreds of thousands of Americans every single year. But you know, it, we know that it's had a disproportionate impact, a devastating impact on black and brown communities. So how do we end this vicious cycle of gun violence in our communities and what approaches are implemented across the country uh, to empower these communities. Yes, uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me, uh, Representative, and thank you to uh, Brady Pack and all of our other partners who organized this. Um, I'm, I'm Greg Jackson. I'm actually a survivor of gun violence. Uh, seven years ago, uh, when my cousins and I were leaving a, a bachelor party, dinner, celebration, uh, we got caught in the middle of a crossfire from two other people that were in a conflict. And uh, unlike the movie, you know, gun violence is not something you can just evade and duck and dodge. You know, when I was shot, I was in the hospital for six months, uh, 21 days in the hospital, but six months of recovery. And I'll never forget uh, an important thing a nurse told me. She said that uh, every day, young black men like me uh, come through those doors and go back into the communities where they came from, um, the same communities where they were struck and, and impacted by violence. And that stuck with me. And I think you, you spoke to it already, but you know, over 70% of those folks who are killed by guns uh, via homicide are black or brown. And while that sounds like a huge number um, in too many communities, that's not just a number. Those are real people. Um, people like Karan Brown uh, in Washington, D.C., who was shot two weeks um, after organizing his own Stop the Violence a rally, he was shot and killed at a McDonald's over a dispute about water bottles. Um, Devon McNeil, who was shot this past 4th of July, a block away from my home, uh, while watching the fireworks as his mom was doing violence intervention um, work in the community and, and really pushing to spread the peace. And so this problem is, is not really a crisis. Uh, it's more than a crisis. This is unfortunately a way of life for too many uh, communities uh, that are black and brown. And so when we think about solutions, from our perspective, we think it first starts with investing in those communities and investing in community-based programs um, that focus on restorative justice, that focus on providing wraparound services for those who are most in need, um, that, that empower uh, community leaders, credible messengers to intervene and prevent violence, to negotiate ceasefires, um, but also just to really uh, provide support for communities that have been overlooked and neglected for too long, whether that's achievement gaps in education um, or economic issues, job training or conflict resolution, or just the pure cycle of trauma. Uh, in my neighborhood, there are three living vigils on the street where people have, have passed away. And every day, we have to walk by that when we go to the youth have to walk by that when they go to school and they relive that trauma every single day. Um, but as present as police are in the community, as present as these terrible memories are, the support and resources aren't there. 
I think three other big things is that we also need to make sure we're dismantling um, laws that really encourage violence in our country. Um, laws like stand your ground laws um, that make situations of hate uh, a lot like what you just shared, um, unfortunately justified in certain parts of our country. You know, over 25 states have some form of standing your ground laws, and we have a duty to dismantle those to ensure that people don't feel empowered to take someone's, someone's life over pride um, versus self-defense. So that's another big thing. Um, the third big thing I will share is that we really need to stand up policies that protect those who are most vulnerable to gun violence uh, and the most at risk. Uh, we too often overlook the impact of domestic violence um, as it pertains to gun violence. We overlook what gun violence does to um, our LGBTQ community, um, the, the, the huge spike in Black trans lives that are being lost, and also um, that are being lost, whether they're getting uh, killed in their homes or as bystanders. And so we must really fight to make sure that there are laws and protections um, focused on supporting and protecting those who are most at risk. Um, and then lastly, we talk about gun violence, we too often overlook the survivors. Um, around 66% of the people who are shot survive. Um, and even when you look at the criminal records of folks who commit a violent offense, most of them were survivors first. And I think that just shows that we have been failing in supporting our survivors, um, providing the resources, the trauma support, um, everything that's needed to help someone get back on track. I know when I was shot, when I entered the hospital, I was faced with three investigators they questioned me for 40 minutes before I could meet my doctor, before I could talk to my surgeon. And after I met my doctor, I talked to my surgeon, I talked to a chaplain, thankfully, and I was sent on my way. But no one ever reached out and said, hey, you know, what community are you going back into? What resources do you need to not fall back into a violent situation? What mental health support, what trauma support do you need to make sure that you are becoming healthy on the inside as much as you are becoming healthy on the outside? And I think that's a huge part of the uh, efforts that we need to invest in to really reduce gun violence. I think too often um, we get hyper focused on the hardware and how do we how do we manage the, the actual physical gun, but we're overlooking the people that are suffering with this trauma now that are already in communities that are saturated with guns, illegal and illegal. Um, and these are just four major ways that we can work to reduce gun violence in communities. Greg, thank you so much for that answer. And um, from uh, one survivor to another. I'm so glad that you're here with us and thank you for everything that you are doing to really invest to make sure that you're investing in people's health and safety. Thank you so much for that. And, and Kelly, uh, Kelly, you're a senior counsel and director of racial justice. Just as we learned, a huge part of breaking uh, the cycle of violence is intervention and interruption. But those are just some of the pieces of a larger puzzle so in addition to this work, Brady also focuses on a supply side approach to preventing gun violence in impacted communities. Can you tell us what is the supply, uh, supply side approach and how does this work to complement the community-based strategy to save lives? First of all, I also just wanna say, I'm so honored to be part of this panel. I admire everyone's work. Um, here, including you, Congresswoman. So it's just an honor to be here. Um, and in terms of the supply side approach, I think the best way to think about it is to think about the gun suppliers and the money that they make and the privileges that they enjoy and the tremendous responsibility they have to make sure they're operating safely. Because almost all guns that are used in crime start in the legal market and are diverted to the illegal market. And according to the ATF, about five to 7% of gun dealers are responsible for about 90% of the guns that are later recovered in crime. So if ATF actually did its job and regulated the industry, then they would be able to block a huge source of crime guns, but they can't because the gun industry has successfully crippled the ATF. And that's why it's so important that we have a president who will actually empower the ATF to do the job that they're supposed to be doing. And to explain, I wanna talk a little bit about Chicago because that's one of the favorite targets for people who love to paint gun violence in blackface and stereotypes and misinformation. Like President Trump who you know, suggested sending in federal troops and let, loves to say that Mayor Lightfoot isn't controlling the city enough. But while he loves to harp about enforcing federal gun laws, he seemed to have forgotten that there are gun laws that also apply to the industry because his administration hasn't done very much at all to do that. And if you were to look at the industry, it would paint a really different picture than the one that people love to tout. 
When it comes to Chicago, there isn't a single gun store in the city. In fact, about 40% of the guns that are recovered in crime in Chicago come from suburban Cook County, predominantly white gun dealers in Cook County, I should say. And those crime guns don't just make their way to the streets of Chicago. Our research has shown that more often than not, crime guns happen when dealers put profits over people and act irresponsibly. So it doesn't make any sense to ignore the industry and the huge role that they play in crime guns. In fact, it's a fatal mistake. And we talked so much already about the toll that gun violence has on black and brown communities. But just one example of the stakes is that gun violence is a completely unnatural man-made preventable phenomena, but it's the number one cause of injury related death for black children and teens. And to really understand the full scope of gun violence, as Greg already said, we can't just think about those who are injured or killed. We also have to think about those who are traumatized or bereaved or stigmatized or financially ruined by gun violence. And the ironic part is that while gun violence robs some black and brown communities of economic activity and jobs and a full life, it keeps other communities afloat. So we have to look at the industry and look at the money. And that's the supply side approach. Because when we look at where guns are coming from, we find that crime guns are predictable and therefore preventable. Many gun sellers don't sell a single crime gun. And the ones that do act negligently or outright criminally, oftentimes routinely, selling guns under the table or knowingly selling to prohibited purchasers. And there's a racial component that we can't ignore. At Brady, we were really curious. We wanted to understand the market better. So we asked ATF for data on five states. And we found that in California, Illinois, Michigan, New Jersey, and Wisconsin, the vast majority of gun dealers are white. And when I say vast, I mean, we're talking 90%, 97%, and suburban. And that data refutes the popular notion that urban gun violence is chiefly a problem that starts and stops with Black people and Black leaders living in black city limits. This is a national problem. And so we have to have a national strategy. And one of the biggest problems with our current national strategy is a lack of accountability. ATF isn't doing their job. They're not shutting down gun dealers who flagrantly and repeatedly break the law. They're not even meeting their own stated goal of inspecting gun dealers once every five years. The current average is once every 10 to 12 years. And it's not entirely ATF's fault. And that's another key for the supply side approach is that the gun industry's congressional allies have successfully done all they can do to hinder ATF. They have systematically cut ATF's funding for decades so that they can investigate and shut down dealers. They've also prevented ATF from releasing trace data to the public, which means that people like you and me can't figure out and identify which gun dealers in suburban communities are supplying the guns that hurt our people. And then finally, these congressional cronies of the gun industry have limited the number of times that ATF can inspect gun dealers, which is rich considering that these are often the same members of Congress who love to talk about law and order and enforcing the law and always want to go to locking people up and investigating. But they're not doing that to the gun industry, which again, from our research, we've seen that a lot of times these problematic dealers are readily identifiable. They act irresponsibly over and over again because they can get away with it. And so we need to be able to regulate and shut down problematic gun dealers. And on top of that, we also have weak national gun laws. And that has a huge, so, so huge impact on the supply side of guns because states with strong gun laws often find that their crime guns are coming from states with weak gun laws. And the COVID-19 pandemic is showing us in a really painful way why that is. Because in the same way that it doesn't matter if you live in a state that's taking the pandemic seriously, when we live in a nation with porous borders and people can travel and bring the virus with them from states that aren't taking it seriously, guns act the same way. And so even if you live in a state with strong gun laws, we're basically almost trapped by the lowest common denominator state because we've seen time and time again that when you study gun trafficking, states that have strong laws often find that they are bringing in guns from weak states. For example, New Jersey is a state that has very strong gun laws and 87%, 87%, that is so much of their crime guns come from other states, often states with weak laws. So the supply side approach is really looking at the sources of guns, whether it's the gun dealers and really making sure that we find those dealers who are acting irresponsibly and regulate them and also having a national strategy in place for a national problem. And right now under the current administration, we're hamstrung with that. And that's why it's so important that we vote in Joe Biden 
and Kamala Harris because they actually are thinking about gun violence in terms of the community aspects that Greg talked about and also in terms of the supply side. And so together we can actually make a dent in this problem. And I also just want to quickly mention to that end that we also have a campaign here at Brady Voting Access Saves Lives campaign that can help you figure out how you can make sure that you and your family's votes matter. Thank you so much for that, Kelly. And I and I, I want to thank you for you know using the example of Chicago because that's where I uh, am originally from. I was born and raised there. Still have family there. Um, and and I do also know too that the largest supplier, Georgia, the state that I live in now, if I can recall correctly, is the largest supplier of black market guns to New York City. So yes, these are all very intrinsic uh, problems that are all interrelated. Well, thank you both so much. Um, thank you for your insight and for your expertise. We really appreciate it. Um, our next panelist, uh, our next discussion will be about guns and the coronavirus. Uh, we'll be focusing on suicide, domestic violence, community violence, as well as ghost guns. Our participants for this panel are Giffords and the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. Uh, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has hit Americans really, really hard, devastatingly hard, creating fear and uncertainty, which has led to an unexpected surge, an unprecedented surge in gun sales, with millions more guns sold compared to previous years. Uh, just in March of this year alone, it's estimated that at least one in 20 U.S. households bought a gun in response to the pandemic. That's a huge number. And in gun deaths that have skyrocketed since the beginning of the pandemic, but it, the, you know, at least 15%, uh, there's been an increase in gun deaths in April and May alone compared to this time last year. May 2020 had the most mass shootings in a single month on record, 56 according to the Gun Violence Archive. We are joined right now by Dakota Jablon from the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence and Nico Bocor from Giffords to discuss guns in the age of coronavirus and what we can do to move forward to a safer future. Thank you both for joining us this evening. Uh, the first question I will uh, ask will be of you, Dakota, uh, and you are Director of Affairs of, um, we'll say, CSGV. Dakota, the COVID-19 pandemic has shined a light on the harsh health disparities and inequities in too many of our communities in America. And, you know, it really needs to be addressed. I mean, these are the elephants in the room. We have to talk about these issues. Can you share with us the research and the solutions um, that uh, to other public health um, concerns like suicide and also domestic violence, can you share with us the research when it comes to access to firearms during a pandemic? Thank you so much, Congresswoman. And I just wanna say, kind of echoing my fellow panelists, it's such an honor to be a part of this really important conversation and especially with my fellow advocates from across the gun violence prevention movement. Um, when it comes to COVID-19, you know, right now we're all under this huge cloud of uncertainty and stress as we live through this pandemic. And we're all kind of experiencing some sort of economic uncertainty and devastation, disconnection to our loved ones and our support systems, a huge change in our daily lives, as well as increased stress when we're not sure what the next day is going to look like. And all of these risk factors are risk factors for both domestic violence and suicide. And as a way to cope with this, more Americans are turning to drugs and alcohol use with a recent CDC report showing that more than one in 10 adults have reported that they have started or increased their use of drugs or alcohol. And alcohol use specifically is a huge risk factor for both suicides and domestic violence, and especially when a firearm is involved. So when you combine all of these risk factors that are being exacerbated by COVID-19, at the same time that gun sales are soaring and people are staying at home where their guns are stored, 
there is unfortunately this perfect storm for the increase in both domestic violence incidents and suicides. And we're already seeing the repercussions of the pandemic on these two different public health crises. There have been numerous media reports showing that there are spikes in calls to domestic violence hotlines and suicide hotlines, as well as anecdotal data showing an increase in these deaths. And just last week, the CDC reported that one in four young adults reported that they seriously considered suicide during June of this year. So it's really important though to note that suicide is not inevitable and it can be prevented, which is exactly why we must prioritize addressing access to guns because firearm access is a key risk factor of whether or not a suicide will be fatal. And that's because firearms are the most lethal suicide attempt method with nine out of 10 attempts with a gun being fatal as in compared to the more commonly chosen methods of overdose, which results in death just one to 2% of the time. And I also really wanna share that it's important to note that most people who attempt suicide do not later go on to die by suicide. And it's a huge myth that once someone is suicidal or they attempt once, they're just going to keep repeating. That is not the case. And I myself am actually a suicide attempt survivor. And so I am a perfect example to show that that is not the case. And one of the reasons I'm here today is because I didn't have access to a gun during my suicidal crisis. So how can we actually prevent these deaths? When I say reducing access to firearms, what does that actually mean? There's a lot of different interventions that we can each take part in. So if you are a gun owner, practicing safer storage of your guns in the home is critical. And if you can, storing them outside of the home, especially during this pandemic, is a huge suicide prevention intervention. Also healthcare providers and especially telehealth care providers right now, engaging in a process called lethal means safety counseling, where they talk with their patients about firearm access and develop a safety plan if their patient is at increased risk for suicide is also an important intervention. And with more people going and buying guns for the first time, it's so important that gun stores actually provide suicide prevention materials and the suicide prevention lifeline to these new gun purchasers. And finally, many people are familiar with the red flag law or extreme risk protection orders, which also have the power to prevent suicides and are available in 19 states and DC. So taken together with these upstream interventions, you know, addressing the economic uncertainty, limiting access to alcohol, connecting more with our loved, one, loved ones, by addressing access to firearms, we can also prevent suicides. Now, when it comes to domestic violence, home is very sadly not a safe place for everyone, and especially when guns and domestic violence are involved. For individuals who are quarantined with their domestic abusers, guns in the home can result in an increase in both injuries and deaths. And while social distancing and isolation are obviously necessary to mitigate the spread of the virus, we have to keep in mind how these measures are affecting Americans who are living with their abusers and especially if an abuser has access to firearms. In America, a woman is five times more likely to be murdered when her abuser has access to a gun. So we can prevent domestic violence homicides by again, addressing access to firearms. We need to pass at the federal level, universal background checks, increase funding for NICS and end default proceed sales to ensure that prohibited gun purchasers especially those who have been convicted of misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence, are not able to purchase a firearm. And this exactly shows why it is more important than ever to elect gun violence prevention champions, like the Congresswoman herself, as well as electing Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, and as well as up and down the ballot from local city council to state elected officials, to the House of Representatives, to the Senate, up to the president, we have to elect gun violence prevention champions everywhere if we want to actually address gun violence and especially suicides and domestic violence in this country and especially during this pandemic. Dakota, thank you so very much. And I, and I am so glad that you're still here with us and you have become a tremendous advocate and we really appreciate uh, all of your wisdom and your knowledge. And thank you so much for investing in our communities, investing and in making sure that people um, live 
long and healthy lives free from gun violence. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Nico, uh, you are uh, the Gov Government Affairs Director for Giffords. Um, Vice News has reported that there's been a surge in sales of ghost guns during the uh, pandemic. Can you tell us what ghost guns are? Because people ask me all the time, what are ghost guns? And should we be concerned? Are you concerned? Yes, thank you so much, Congresswoman Macbeth. I'm really glad to be having this important conversation with you and Dakota and everyone else, um, especially those of you watching. Uh, the Vice News report that you mentioned is accurate and very troubling. Not only are gun sales overall spiking, but ghost guns are turning up in more places. And here's why that's such a problem. Ghost guns are weapons without any serial numbers or records of sales, uh, making them untraceable in law enforcement investigations. Um, and if that wasn't concerning enough, federal and state gun safety laws, including, for example, background checks, uh, only apply to fully assembled firearms or two frames or receivers, uh, which are the key parts of a gun that are regulated as a firearm. Unfortunately, the ATF has determined that gun safety laws do not apply to unfinished frames or receivers. All the other parts are unregulated. Uh, you can get them without a background check, and if you already have a frame or receiver, you can build your very own gun. And it is a gun that, let's be clear, can cause exactly the same damage as firearms that require background checks. Because of this gap in the law, these nearly completed weapons, which are made of up to 80% firearm components, uh, can be manufactured and sold by unlicensed businesses uh, without a background check, record of sale, or serial number. These ghost guns, uh, again, as deadly as any firearm when assembled, are then able to be used by those who want to inflict violence without any trace. And as Kelly explained earlier, being able to trace gun crime guns is so critical to public safety. Um, so I think the next question is, well, where are people getting these ghost guns? Um, and the answer is businesses have discovered this loophole and they are selling uh, DIY kits, do it yourself uh, at home gun kits. Now let's be clear again, these kits are not, you know, kits that you and I might be more familiar with. They're DIY kits designed to enable someone who does not know how to assemble a functional firearm, uh, a novice even, to build one in an hour or less using only common household tools. Um, they're often sold uh, as kits online at gun shows uh, without any regulation. Uh, and they can be assembled using 3D printed frames or receivers. So, you know, again, clearly these are incredibly dangerous um, and we're seeing a very concerning trend. Uh, we're seeing increased popularity of those guns. Uh, they are being sought out by those people who can't pass a background check, but want to obtain a firearm. Uh, and let's think about that. This is a product being sold with firearm traffickers and people who can't pass background checks in mind. Um, and law enforcement officers across the country are increasingly encountering trafficking rings that are mass manufacturing and selling these firearms. Uh, for example, in Los Angeles, Los, law enforcement uh, busted a 10 member ghost gun trafficking ring and seized 45 firearms. And in recent years, ghost gun trafficking rings have been uncovered all across the country. Uh, for example, in Colorado, Florida, Iowa, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, these lethal weapons are putting public safety at serious risk. Uh, as you know, uh, and too many personally know, gun violence has very real devastating consequences. We are already seeing the harm that ghost guns are doing to our community. This threat is real, uh, and I'll share just two examples with you. Uh, in 2019, gunmen firing assault-type ghost guns fatally shot law enforcement officers in an ambush attack in Sacramento um, and a deadly shootout in Riverside. And then in another incident last year, a 16-year-old used a ghost gun to kill two students and injure three others at Saugus High School in California. He was too young to legally purchase a gun, but was able to use a ghost gun. Uh, these are just a couple of the many horrific incidents that can be linked back to ghost guns, and the threat is only growing. Um, now in 2020, we're seeing 
recent reports uh, that indicate more than 40% of crime guns recovered by ATF in parts of states like California have been these unserialized, untraceable ghost guns. Uh, sales of ghost guns have spiked in recent months with dealers of these DIY ghost gun kits bragging about their high volume sales. One even describes some of the customers seeking the kits as being of the anti-government persuasion. Those among us know, you know, those who are driven by hate and should not be able to obtain a firearm um, are using these loopholes to uh, obtain and build untraceable guns. They're able to do it anonymously in the privacy of their own homes. Uh, the country is currently dealing with a multitude of public health and safety concerns. And as Dakota just reminded us, this pandemic that we are all facing together the stay at home orders, um, they have coincided with an increase in risk of gun violence for too many. Uh, the growing proliferation of ghost guns is one of the pressing gun safety issues facing our country today. And the COVID-19 crisis only heightens the urgent need to act so that these dangerous weapons can't be used to harm more families and communities. So what can we do? Well, the answer is we need to bring immediate accountability and transparency to the sale of ghost gun parts in every state. Um, if the Trump administration and Congress refuse to act, states uh, need to pass legislation to protect their residents from unregulated ghost guns. And several states have taken that courageous step. Um, they've taken action to regulate ghost guns, either by requiring people who assemble ghost guns to serialize them, uh, requiring sellers to obtain licenses to conduct background checks, or by stopping the sale of these frames and receivers entirely, these unserialized frames and receivers entirely. Um, Connecticut, California, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Washington State, they've already taken these critical steps. Um, and while their efforts are critical to public safety, we have to remember ghost guns are flowing freely across state lines by gun traffickers. And comprehensive national legislation is needed to protect all communities from these dangerous weapons. Um, thankfully, we do have leaders like yourself in Washington, DC, who are taking up gun safety um, and are championing this issue. And many have recognized what we need to do about this. There is currently legislation that has been introduced in Congress that would provide the needed solutions to ghost guns. And we, and hopefully everyone watching, um, are gonna continue to fight this important fight, um, hold people accountable. And um, Congressman McBath, thank you for fighting this fight, for being a leader and for holding this important conversation today. I know everyone has so much that we are facing. Um, uh, as uh, you know, within the world today. And I think that it is so important that we continue to talk about um, the issue of gun safety uh, and do more to protect uh, all communities and families in this country. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Nico. And, you know, I thank you so much for giving us so much expansive information, very comprehensive information about ghost guns. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people still don't even know what it is. They don't even know that they exist. And this is just another reason why we need to really continue to build upon the work uh, that we have to do in keeping our community safe. And everyone, if you hear, it's thunder in the background. So I'm so sorry if you can hear that we're having a big storm. But, um, well, thank you so much. Um, our next panel discussion uh, will be about building power, organizing collective power in support of gun violence prevention. And our participants on this panel will be the groups uh, March for Our Lives and Every Town. I, like far too many people across the country, got active in this issue because I have been personally affected by gun violence. Uh, the loss of my son Jordan was completely devastating to me. And I channeled my pain into purpose, into action. I joined Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I've been devoting my life to preventing uh, any other parent from having to feel the loss that I have felt. Um, but following the, the mass shooting at Parkland, uh, in, you know, in Parkland, Florida, I, I just, I really I'd had enough. I'd had enough. I know there've been so many people like me, gun safety advocates working all across the country, yet we still were not moving the needle on gun safety. And I decided I was gonna run for Congress myself. Today, 
this movement for gun safety has swelled. And students, teachers, moms, dads, doctors, people everywhere in America are calling for meaningful gun action, uh, meaningful action, excuse me, on gun violence prevention. And you know, this, this issue is very intersectional. Many of the people, um, the same people that you know you see speaking out on gun safety are speaking up on a, on a whole host of different kinds of issues um, because they really are all interconnected. They're all interrelated and they're all impacting our country in, in, in really devastating ways. So many of them uh, are speaking out for reforms and also standing up to say that black lives matter. Grassroots uh, movements matter because they are what drives the change, changing the culture on the ground, boots on the ground. And so I'm so excited right now because I'm joined by Maxwell Frost of March for Our Lives and Kari Pinnaker. Kari Pinnaker, which I, I've worked with him for many years now uh, and, and his work, uh, phenomenal work that he's done in gun safety as well. Uh, he's now a DNC delegate and a member of the Everytown uh, Survivor Network. Uh, and I'm joining, they're, both of them are joining me now to discuss building the power of the movement and how from this point on do we move forward. Um, Maxwell, we'll start with you first. All right, and you are the National Organizing Director, Director for March for Our Lives. Maxwell, gun violence prevention is frequently rated as a top issue for young voters across the country between the ages of 18 and 25. And March for Our Lives is attributed with contributing to the record-breaking high turnout numbers of those young people that, that turned out to vote in our 2018 midterms. How is March for Our Lives mobilizing young voters on the issue of gun violence prevention across the nation ahead of this upcoming November election. Yeah, for sure. And thank you all so much for having me. And thank you, Congresswoman, for your service and the work that you do. Um, I think it's important that we take a step back and recognize the importance of the youth vote, specifically in 2020. I mean, when we look back in history, we see that the peaks of youth voting were always in concert and connected with mass social movements, from the anti-war movement to March for Our Lives, um, the movement against violence and for peace. Um, and now with the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Tony McDade, and, and many, many, many black and brown folks around the country, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. And so, and like aside from March for Our Lives, you know, I'm an organizer on the, on the ground here in Orlando, Florida for our racial justice movement. And it's brought out thousands of young people who have never been involved with politics in their life. Um, and they've come out and said, I, I saw it happen and it pushed me to either put my body on the line or leave work early or do this to come out and be involved. And so March, a March for Our Lives, we recognize what's going on. Um, we realize what's going on. And so we know that, you know, we're not going to tell young people to stop protesting and go vote, right? Uh, because we believe that we need to do both and, uh, and we must do both to uh, achieve the justice we want to seek. Um, you know, I believe that we need three things. We need political power, which is done through voting. We need the culture change. Um, and we need people power, which is garnered on the streets through the protesting and through direct action. And so all three of those are not identical, but indivisible. And so on March for Our Lives, we aren't just going to shove voting down uh, young people's throats in disregards to the concerns they have, um, because, you know, the age of the single issue voter, I think, is slowly going away, especially with this generation Gen Z. And so March for Our Lives, we're taking an intersectional approach to the epidemic of gun violence, that it's the symptom of larger systematic injustice. And, you know, the recent events and atrocities in our nation have pushed young people to hit the streets uh, once again, and that energy, I've seen it directly transferred into every single one of our March for Our Lives organizers, and they range from 12 years old to 25 years old, you know, um, and, and they realize that we're fighting for so much more. Yes, to prevent mass shootings, but also to prevent the largest mass shooting that happens in our country on a daily basis in our black and brown communities. Yes, to achieve universal background checks, but also to create a more just world where people don't feel the need to arm themselves to feel safe in the first place. And after having conversations with organizers across the country, what we found is they are ready to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. 
And it's become more and more apparent over the past few months with state sanctioned violence going on around the country that the time for massive political and cultural change is now. And the organizers of March for Our Lives have a resolve and motivation that rivals the sun. And it's not just the people at March for Our Lives, it's the people at Sunrise, Dream Defenders, United We Dream, International Indigenous Youth Council, and the thousands of on the ground organizations that are fighting for justice right now. And they hold a righteous anger in their hearts, right? Um, and by phone banking, text banking, using social media, hosting innovative events, and using direct action, we're gonna speak to the world that they know we deserve to live in. And that's how March for Our Lives is going to achieve high youth voter turnout in 2020. Max, well, thank you so much. I mean, you, you <laughs> are leading an amazing uh, grassroots movement. And I, I liken your organization and you yourself to be our hope dealers for the future. So thank you so much. There is a lot of hope that I have in, in our future with you in charge there. Uh, next, we're going to speak with uh, Karee Pennebaker, who is the DNC delegate and member of Every Town Survivor Network. And as I said, uh, Karee and I go back a very long way. I uh, used to call me Mama Lucy <laughs> as we work together in compliance uh, prevention. Karee, I know your story so personally well, uh, but can you talk to everyone watching tonight about how you got involved in the gun violence prevention movement. And also, can you kind of talk about what's at stake and how people can get involved in this very, very critical election? And even though most campaigns are right now are virtual, my campaign is virtual, what can people do to help elect gun sense candidates all up and down the ballots this, no this November? Sure. So uh, I am so honored to be here with you today. And while I have affectionately called you Mama Lucy for so long, I am honored to call you Congresswoman McBath. That's even more important to me. Um, and I also wanna say that uh, before I get started, um, to, to those folks who might be struggling with uh, a crisis of their own, uh, that it, it, it is okay to not be okay. Uh, that you should call for help. Your life has value and has worth. And I'm begging you to go call, uh, call a friend. Uh, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. I have called myself, and it, it is nothing to be ashamed of. And that is one thing that we, especially as Black men, need to reconcile with, that it is okay to ask for help. It doesn't make you less of a man to go do so. So please uh, make sure you call a friend and, and make sure that you don't have easy access to a gun. That is one thing that I wish uh, my mom uh, would not have had access to. Uh, my mom, uh, Joyce, was 27 years old. I was not even two years old yet. Uh, I don't know what my own mother's voice sounds like. I don't know what it's like to have my own mother tell me that she loves me. I've had countless people tell me that they're proud of me and all these things, but you know what I would give just to hear my own mother one time tell me that she was proud of me. But I was robbed of those moments, those special moments, moments like even learning how to brush my teeth. I was robbed of that because she had easy access to a gun and she was severely mentally unwell. Uh, and instead of removing gun, uh, the gun from her access, uh, no one even thought about it. A month before my mom shot and killed herself, uh, she told her best friend, <clears throat> excuse me, that she wanted to die. And still, no one removed the gun from her access. So that bullet uh, removed the ability for me just to be able to have a, a regular relationship with my mom, right? I don't know what it's like to have my mom uh, pin the, the flower on my lapel at prom. My mom missed the birth of my three children. So and it, it is one of these things that has caused me to be unable to speak about this issue for the overwhelming majority of my life. Uh, and it wasn't until I sent Shannon Watts a email uh, many years ago, back in 2013, 14, something like that. Uh, and she took me in um, and she introduced me to Erica Lafferty and, and to, to Lucy and to Richard Martinez. And the three of you literally introduced me to my voice. They help me understand the part that I have to play in this moment and in this movement, but really ultimately what you did is that you saved my life. Uh, I have attempted suicide three times before in my life, twice with pills, once with a gun. And thankfully I didn't pull the trigger. I was able to call uh, a friend of mine and I have not touched a gun since, nor should I. And that's why it's important now when you realize that while we all can't be single issue voters, 
there are these issues that really permeate uh, the division between whether you're Republican or Democrat, because Republicans die from gun violence just like Democrats do. The bullet that exploded my mother's head did not stop and ask her, are you a Democrat? Or was your son going to grow up to be a Democrat? It didn't do that. The bullets that exploded, the, the young, beautiful bodies of the children from Sandy Hook didn't stop and ask them, well, what are you going to grow up to be? Are you going to be a Republican or a Democrat? It didn't do that. That's why it's incumbent upon every single one of us, every one of us, to show up and vote every election, not just in November, because you got folks at local level, whether you're running for mayor or, or assembly or uh, uh, whatever the case may be, who are making decisions that are going to impact gun violence prevention policy. And you have too many people right now who have access to power who are literally doing nothing to help make sure that families don't have to realize what this pain is actually like. I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask to be born. I didn't ask to, to be born to a mother who would eventually go and shoot herself. I didn't ask for this. But since I'm here, I have one choice. What am I going to do with this pain? Can I let it control me? Or can I decide to go do something powerful with it and make sure that fewer families and communities know what this is like? So I, I, I go to the state house. I've been to Congress. I make sure that the people that are in our government here know who I am. They know my name. And they know I'm not going to stop until I get the action that I want. And I, I've heard people uh, throughout this, this convention because it's virtual. We're not in person. We don't have that kind of camaraderie and stuff anymore like we might expect. They might say it's less exciting. I can assure you when I wake up every morning as a gun violence survivor, when I literally have to survive myself because suicidality just doesn't go away, right? This, you can't just turn it on and off like a switch. I have to survive myself every single day. The last thing I need is entertainment. I don't need for this party to entertain me. I don't need for this convention to entertain me. What I need, what I'm begging folks to do is get involved, get engaged, and make sure we have more gun sense champions up and down that battle. Not just because uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are the most uh, courageous and, and, and strongest gun violence prevention champions we've ever had. That's, that's not enough. We need folks that'll join Congresswoman Lucy McBath to make sure we can pass universal background checks. We can beat back red flag laws that, that put our families at risk. We need more people at the powers, uh, at the levels of government who have these, these powers to, to do the right thing and not look at these issues as black and white or like the, the, the abstract of statistics. My mom is not a statistic. Her, she, she, her head exploded inside of the car on the side of a road by herself. She's not just some number. Jordan is not just some number. Dontre Hamilton is not just some number. Sierra Guyton is not just some number. Layla Peterson is not just some number. Right? We belong to families who, who struggle every single day. And when those special days come, like Christmas, or in my case, like Mother's Day, and there's an empty chair at that table, it's heartbreaking. None of y'all want this. I can assure you of that. So what you can do is make sure you go out and vote, not just vote them, right? Voting is the start of the process. Because then once that person gets elected, you get to push them on the issue you ask them to, to run a campaign for in the first place. That's our job. We get to hold these people accountable because their paycheck comes from us. But our pain is that thing that motivates us and keeps us going and reminds us of why we can't stop doing this work. If you remember back in, in prior elections, like in 2008, when my favorite president, Barack Obama, was running, we didn't talk about gun violence the way we do right now. Even in prior elections between 2008 and 2016, we didn't talk about gun violence prevention like we do now. But go find a candidate that doesn't have gun violence prevention on their website, someone who's not talking about that issue. You're gonna, it's few and far between because they know how important that is. And they also know that if they don't do it, just like every time a mom's demand talks about all the time, we will change the law or we will change the people that make them. Just like some of my friends in other states, regular volunteers decided, I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna do something. Not everybody can go run for office, but you have a voice, you have a vote, and it's, I am begging you to go do it. If nothing else, go vote for Joyce. Go vote for Jordan. Go vote for Don Trey, please. Because no other family should have to live like this. None of you want to experience life walking in my shoes and how painful that is. I would do anything to hear my mom just simply say that she loves me.
That's something I was robbed of. You don't want to find out what that's like. Don't wait until this epidemic ends up on your doorstep. So please make sure you get involved. Find out who your gun sense champions are, who the gun sense candidates are. Uh, Moms of Man has a list of those folks. You can find out what, they, what they're doing. You can phone bank for them. You can uh, get on social media and tweet and Facebook for them. You can text for them. There's a myriad of things we can do in this digital space to make sure that more and more folks know that gun violence prevention is on every single ballot. But it's up to us to make that change, and I'm begging you to do so. Thank you. Well, Karee, thank you so, so very much, everyone. I'm so sorry, I just got kicked out. As I said before, we have a huge storm here and I just got kicked out and I'm just back on again and I do apologize. Um, so sorry for that. And I'm just trying to get back to, to our closing, but I just wanted to say, Karee, thank you so much. I do know your story and you have just been a stalwart for uh, gun violence prevention, especially by suicide. And I can't ever thank you enough for everything that you continue to do. And you um, have really, I, I just want you to know that you have made your mother very, very proud. Um, well, with that, I wanna thank all of our, our, our panelists here. Thank you so, so very much for uh, just really uh, investing, investing in our communities, investing in a safer culture of gun violence uh, people that you work on behalf every single day, you may never see them, you may never know who they are, you may never know their names, but it's vitally important for you to understand that it really, really matters. Everything that you've done for this country really, really matters. Um, and I just want to say thank you again to Brady for, uh, for Brady United. Thank you so much for hosting this event. Thank you for all the work that you continue to do. Uh, it's so important and I'm so honored to be a part of it. Thank you for allowing me to work beside you. And of course, thank you to all of you that are particip participating tonight. Thank you for finding it important enough to learn how you can be resourceful and to be in the movement and to stand up to save the lives of so many Americans. The road of, ahead of us is very, very difficult. Uh, but I know that uh, with support with all of the individuals that are on this call tonight, people like you on this call, we will make a real difference. We've already made a difference. Please do not lose hope. And the last thing I would like to say is don't forget to vote. You heard that over and over again tonight. Please do not forget to vote. As Michelle Obama, our past first lady, first said the other night, she said that, you know, there is so much at stake and people's lives are depending on this vote and this election. Well, do know that gun violence prevention is a movement that people's lives are depending on. So thank you so much for instilling hope in America. And thank you so much for giving us hope for the future. Please make a plan to vote. Talk to your friends and family and about how they can get involved in um, gun violence prevention, but also going to the ballot to make sure that they are voting for gun sense champions up and down the ballot together. We will elect leaders who prioritize our issues, uh, prioritizing keeping people safe and keeping people alive. That is our mission. And with that, thank you so much and good night.